Good morning. I know you guys have been waiting for this video for so long. So this is all about determination of eligibility for hospice. So let me share my screen and let's get to it. Like my background, jingle bells and all that good stuff. Okay. And this is our PowerPoint, which you will get in your email. Okay. And let me make my face a little smaller. And eligibility determination requirements for hospice. Okay. Because this has been a hot topic for a while. So what do we have? This is an overview that I'm going to give you because in this PowerPoint, I'm going to give you specific federal regs directly from CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, regarding how eligibility is determined. These federal regulations are the laws that we have to follow every day in our practice, and they are in concert with the National Council for the State Boards of Nursing and every state's Nurse Practice Act that directs the practice for nurses, RNs, LPNs, and nurse practitioners. So thank you for your attention to this very important matter. So federal um, regulations on eligibility. Hospice eligibility is not based on diagnosis. It's based on prognosis. Well, what does that mean? It's got to be done by a physician, an MD or a DO. And it's very different than any other type of certification that's done by a doctor. So most certs are done on medical necessity. Well, this is not, okay? It's based on how the doctor feels as far as the patient's proximity to terminal status. And it's based on reasonable and necessary requirements for the palliation or management of the terminal illness and any related conditions. And that is the actual federal like regulation that 42 CFR. And then a face-to-face -face encounter documentation when performed by a nurse practitioner or a PA, they are only gathering objective data to give to the physician to let the physician determine eligibility. An NP is not allowed to determine eligibility. The end, neither is an RN, okay? I wanna make sure that's crystal clear. So, and it's based on prognosis. So the doctor has to make a six month terminal prognosis. In general terms, when a patient's eligible for hospice, uh, the life expectancy, is six, six, life expectancy is six months or less. And aggressive treatment is either A, not an option anymore, or B, they just don't want it. And then hospice eligibility can be met with these two things, right? A, one significant terminal diagnosis as, you know, your patient meets Medicare disease specific criteria. That's the LCD that I talk about all the time. So it could be they have cancer. Or B, multiple comorbidities contribute to the terminal decline. Your patient exhibits multiple signs and symptoms that suggest a terminal prog progression, but don't add up to a single terminal diagnosis. So often a combination of diagnoses is accelerating decline, yet a patient does not have to meet all the criteria listed, okay? So they've given us some very, you know, a lot of latitude, if you will, with, with meeting the standard, okay? Here I have, put copies from the actual federal regulations, the CFR, conditions of participation. And over here on the right, you can see the attestation of the nurse practitioner or non-certifying hospice physician, and this is about the face-to-face, -face, shall state the clinical findings of that visit were provided to the certifying physician to use in determining continuing eligibility. Not to determine eligibility, for the doctor to refer to in addition to any other assessment data, okay? I wanna make sure that's crystal clear, okay? Now, here I've got actually, again, word for word, the federal regulations. These are the conditions of participation, okay? And you see the parts in red, certification of terminal illness for hospice benefits shall be based on the clinical judgment of the hospice medical director or physician member of IDG and the individuals attending if he or she has one. No one other than a medical doctor or doctor of osteopathy can certify or recertify a terminal illness. And predicting life expectancy is not always exact. 
The fact that a beneficiary lives longer than expected in itself is not cause to terminate benefits. Okay, pretty clear, pretty clear. Use of objective scales, this is so important, okay? When we gather data as nurses and relay that data to the physician, it's got to be objective and accurate, okay? So let's talk about scales. The palliative performance scale, okay? That's a great tool for measuring the progressive decline of somebody. It's got five dimensions, functionally, ambulation, activity level, evidence of disease, self-care, oral intake, and level of consciousness, okay? To score, there are 11 levels, okay, from zero to 100% and only in 10% increments. Every decrease in 10% is a pretty significant decrease in physical function, okay? So when we look at the scale itself, here you go, and they give you very specific directions on how to use it and what these things mean, okay? So in other words, when we look at the scale, we're, we're talking about looking to the left, Okay, leftward. So this is the way they explain it. Uh, for example, the first thing you do is you look at ambulation. Okay, can they fully ambulate without any assistance? Is it reduced? Do they mainly sit, lie, or are they totally bed bound? Right. So you go, you pick that first. Okay. The subtle differences then get picked apart in the other columns. So when we talk about a PPS of 30%, they're either profoundly weak or paralyzed that they can't get out of bed and they can't do any self-care. The difference between sit and lie in bed is proportionate to the amount of time that the patient is able to sit up versus needing to lie down, okay? So activity and evidence of disease, what does that mean? So that's talking about the physical and the investigative evidence that shows degrees of progression. For example, breast cancer. A local recurrence would imply some disease. Metastases to the lung, to the bone, that would imply significant disease. Multiple metastases in the lung and the bone and the liver, the brain, hypercalcemia, other major complications would be extensive disease, okay? So the above extent of disease is judged in context, context with the ability to maintain one's work and hobbies or activities. So decline in activity could mean that the person can still play golf, but can't do 18 holes. They can do nine holes, right? And people who like to walk, they will gradually reduce the distance they can walk, although they may continue trying, sometimes even when they're close to death. Please read this, all right? This is very important. So this gives you a really good explanation of how this scale works, okay? So that's that. Then the next thing we have is the FAST scale, only for Alzheimer's, not for any other form of dementia, not Lewy body, not vascular, not frontotemporal, only for Alzheimer's dementia because Alzheimer's dementia has a disease trajectory that's very predictable. In order to be hospice eligible, 7A or worse, okay? Pretty, pretty straightforward, okay? Pain scales, there are lots of different pain scales. The numeric scale, in order to use it, the patient has to be awake, alert, and oriented times three. What is your pain from zero to 10? Zero is no pain, 10 is excruciating. Pretty straightforward, okay? The Wong-Baker faces scale, we use that for kids and people that are like developmentally disabled, just say which of those faces is how you feel. And they can point to the face and then we put a number to it, right? the pain add scale. That's the pain assessment in advanced dementia, okay? What we're looking at, we're looking at their breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, and consolability. It's almost like the flax scale that we use for infants. So in other words, if all those things are normal or there's no negative vocalization, like they're not moaning, they're smiling or they're flat, if they're relaxed and they're not, they don't need to be consoled, right? A one, you can read, I don't need to read this to you, gives you specific criteria, right? Of what they would look like and what number you would assign to them. So basically you just go across, what's their breathing look like? Is there negative vocalization? What is their facial expression? What is their body language? And it could be anger because anger 
can be the manifestation of pain in someone with advanced dementia? And then can they be consoled or distracted? Anything greater than a four needs immediate intervention. Please don't tell me the patient has no pain, number one, ever. Um, if the patient has pain meds ordered to PRN, that means at some point they had pain. And it's not a snapshot. Your assessment is not this very minute for this visit. Your assessment is since the last nursing visit, or if it's an admission, in the past three months, what kind of pain have they had? Okay? It's, it's pretty simple. So I'm 60 and things hurt. <clears throat> okay. Next we have the Braden scale. And this one's pretty self-explanatory too. You should do the Braden scale on anyone that is not ambulatory. If they're bed bound or wheelchair bound, they lead a bed to chair existence. You should be doing a Braden scale score. And it's very self-explanatory. There are these categories, friction and share, shear, nutrition, mobility, activity, moisture, and sensory perception. And each of them gets a score, which gives you a total score at the bottom. And that tells you what the risk for skin breakdown is. Okay. Next, the LCDs that I talk about all the time, right? CMS gives us these to help the physician determine eligibility. Just fill in the form, okay? Fill in the form. That's all you have to do. Follow the directions and fill in the form. So for cancer, for example, if you have a patient with cancer that meets the following criteria. So they have to meet both one and two. In other words, disease with metastases or progression from an earlier stage to metastatic disease, okay? Cancer is pretty much a slam dunk, but let's look at some of the others. This is the general guideline, all right? So it's telling you guidelines two and four must be met, three and five are optional. So two and four must be met. The, the disease progression is one, all right? Two, let's go to two gives you the decline in the Karnofsky scale if we use that, right? Um, a lot of people use the Karnofsky performance scale, which is almost very similar, not quite equivalent, but very similar to the PPS. Um, the FAST scale, okay? Dependence on assistance for two or more activities of daily living, two or more. If they have pressure ulcers, spike care, any increasing ER visits, hospitalizations, physicians visits, and then what are their comorbidities? Even if it's not their primary diagnosis, these add to that cumulative effect of the patient, you know, their terminal decline, okay? Alzheimer's, again, sections in one and two have to be present. So one is the patient severely demented, they have to be beyond a seven. And then two, patients should show all of the following characteristics, which means they can't ambulate independently. In other words, somebody has to either help them or they need an assistive device. They can't dress without assistance. They can't bathe without assistance. It doesn't mean that they're completely dependent, but they need assistance for all of those things. And then you have an extra one. Does the patient, has the patient had any of the following medical complications? like aspiration, pneumonia, septicemia, decubitus ulcers, fever, inability or unwillingness to maintain fluid or caloric intake. So in other words, are they losing weight? Okay, very important. Pulmonary, so I can go down the list. I don't need to read these all to you, but I will even send you the actual LCDs that I downloaded from CMS, okay? Now, here's another popular question. Must the patient decline? to be eligible or to remain eligible for hospice. No, when a patient appears to have stabilized, this is coming right from CMS. Get back to the diagnosis, why were they admitted? How have you been managing the symptoms or the disease, right? What are you monitoring them for? What other conditions do they have, comorbidities? How do they look compared to someone else that's well of the same age? And what interventions are we providing that are contributing to the plateau? Right, so we are, if it weren't for our services, would they be plateaued or might they be in worse shape, right? Okay, 
CMS guidance. Again, I do everything compliantly through everything that the government has provided us, federal regs, state regs, and also our accrediting body, which is CHAP. CMS says the certificate of terminal illness and the plan of care are two different documents and they require specific things in each of them, okay? So the condition of participation speaks to these documents very differently, okay? So the POC is a group project. So the plan of care is spiritual, social work, nursing. We all get together, right? The CTI is physician driven because we need a prognosis and only the physician can prognosticate. I think I said that in times, right? <laughs> I think I did anyway, okay? Documentation and evaluation. So what's our job as nurses? We are to gather data. We do a head to toe assessment, health history, social history, family history, and then we objectively provide that to the doctor. It is critically important to provide objective data. Don't need your opinion as, as to the eligibility or the prognosis that's outside the scope of practice that is defined by the Nurse Practice Act. We do not decide eligibility, okay? We do not, we cannot. So all we're doing is we are gathering data objectively and saying to the doctor, here's what I assessed. Here's the LCD I filled out, you decide. So simple, but it's gotta be a thorough assessment. That's the other part of this. And I'm gonna do a video next on assessing patients thoroughly and what are the things that you need to be looking out for. And uh, the one thing I'm going to add in here too as an afterthought is the, the MAC, the mid-arm circumference. You must obtain a MAC, same arm, without clothing. It is from the shoulder to the elbow, midway, midway point. Again, no sleeves on, no clothing on, not too tight and not too loose with the tape measure. That should be done every visit and on admission, okay? Because if they can't get on a scale at some point, they won't be able to. How do we determine that they are losing weight or whatever, okay? So keep that in mind when you're assessing your patients. Common documentation problems. These are things I read. So using words like stable, unchanged, good. What's good? What's bad? Right, the very, very subjective words, can't use them. They appear to be losing weight. What do you mean? Evidence by what? Or do they have sunken cheekbones, right? By temporal wasting. What is making you think that? You have to be specific. The patient seems anxious. What do you mean, right? How would you define big and small, right? It depends on your perspective. So you got to avoid these words. Document abnormal findings consistently using objective words. It's helpful to compare and contrast. They were able to blah, 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 and now they're only able to blah, blah, blah. Another issue, not to regularly weigh or measure. Make sure to always obtain baseline measurements, the weight, the height if possible, the MAC, which arm, and use the same arm every time, weekly. I see sometimes medications are changed. There's a note in the nursing note saying the patient was ordered an antibiotic, but there's no order for it or we're doing wound care without an order. Something in the assessment resulted in the medication change, but I don't know what it was. Um, and don't tell me good result. I see that a lot. Antibiotics given, good result. What does that mean? Good is not something that you should be using as a word to describe. You should be saying, okay, patient was having burning with urination, and since the antibiotic was started, patient no longer complains of burning. Foul smell is gone, right? It's, that's simply objective. Okay? Don't, don't use these words like good, bad. Um, ensure the process where how the patient tolerates their ADLs is documented. In other words, it was taking them 20 minutes to eat. Now it takes 45 minutes to eat. That's a change. That's a decline. Okay. And the hospice aide should be reporting to the RN and the RN should be updating the hospice aid assignment, which should be specific every research minimally, and at least looking at it every two weeks to make sure that it's accurate. 
fits the patient. If we do our jobs the way the regulatory bodies that govern us intend for us to do it, then we don't have to worry about a thing. We can be certain that we're doing the best. We're providing the best compliant care to our patients. And you don't have to be, oh my God, Jaco's coming. Oh my God, Chap is coming. Good, let them come. We do it the right way every day. And then we don't have to whine about it. If you have any questions about any of this, please reach out. Okay, I'm gonna drop the mic. Ho, ho, ho. Thank you. And again, questions, please let me know.